Hello there everyone and welcome back to the TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. America Lover Lover Lover. But well, we got quite a few things to read about as our dear old Philippard. He is, well, not feeling quite bueno as I would usually say, but sparks fly. That's why we kept our dealing secret from the state in the first place. The first time we trust you bleeding hearted amateurs with something this happens. This would not be a problem if we were just transparent with the American people in the first place. Public trust in government is eroding, and to be frank, I can't exactly blame the public for that. We simply cannot. President Hart rested his elbows in the Oval Office, face buried in his hands as Truman and Kissinger argued back and forth. Enough, he finally snapped. Harry, I want a serious investigation within the state as, as to who the leaker is. Dr. Kissinger, stay. Truman gave a crisp nod, not bothering to hide the scowl on his face, but he stormed out of the Oval Office. As the door closed behind him, Kissinger turned to Hart. Mr. President, I'm sorry it's come to this. However, I'm sure that you're def with your decisive leadership. Henry didn't ask you to stay so you could kiss my butt, Hart said. What the heck are you doing to fix this? Kissinger cleared his throat. Moments, President. I first question the ability of Secretary Truman to find this leaker. Desperate actions needed if we were to avoid a collapse in America's diplomatic credibility. I suggest a wiretapping of the State Department HQ so we might quickly identify any further leaks. <laughs> Hart's eyes widened. Wiretapping a Department of the Executive Branch? It's not a dictatorship, Henry. You're dismissed. I'll hear no more of Gestapo tactics. He rested his hand, head in his hands after Kissinger left the room. What he had gotten America into? That's a good point. Super times, this measures also, if things go really poorly for us, well, we'll do okay in the end. But, open the checkbook. Jacquin once again sighed. The prices were lower, but even a simple manager like him knew it was putting a band-aid on a cracked dam. He was once again reading it through the paperwork. The newspaper wrote of government subsidies being given for the protections problem they created. This is what I get for voting Republican-Democratic. Jacquin sighed. His co-worker Jason, who had been smoking a cigarette, agreed. Amen, brother. The moment you put these darn uh, <clears throat> black people into power and all goes to crap. Jaquin grimaced at the visceral racism. He wasn't a fan of Harden's urban renewal, however, he certainly wasn't a racist. Not since a platoon of African-American troops got him out of Honolulu. What? No, no, this is gosh darn protectionist policies, the waste of our tax dollars. God, I hate it when you're on my side, Jason. Jaquin uh, uh, rubbed his temples. Being a manager was stressful enough. As a racist co-worker, wasn't making his life any less stressful or reluctant to eat RDC voter. It was spending quite a bit of money. Oh, good God. But the spending power of average citizens, or citizens in the average cities, will increase by 9%, and final thanks. Philip Parr was tired of saying goodbye. He hated having to sit across from the remarkable people he'd worked with to save the country and know the time, at his time, with each of them was drawing to a close, but this talk, Hart thought it would hurt the most of all. And based on the look on Jane Jacobs' face, it hurt her just as much. I called you here to say thank you, Hart told him. Thank you for absolutely everything you've done to make this a better country for our children. It was an honor to have you in my cabinet. Jacobs couldn't hold it in. She sniffled, eyes wet. I'm the one who should be thanking you, she managed, finally. For the opportunity to do the work I've done, for giving me more pride in what we've made this country than I have ever could have imagined, and... And for being a good friend, she met his eyes, tears flowing freely, and told him the only thing after everything that uh, really mattered. I'll miss you. As we are currently doing, uh, we reflect on Chep's career, but we've got some focuses, or focuses, well, we're going to read some focuses too, but we've got some comments such as, I think in the spirit of RP, or role-playing, that Hart would work as much as possible and finish as much as possible before leaving for good. It is, and someone else commented, it's my civic duty, and that I give my all to serve those who believe in me, fill apart, probably. Now we'll keep going with this. But, well, and we'll do these two, don't get me wrong, but we're going to do, like, an event, and then a focus, an event, and a focus, so. Um, I think I read this last time, so if we're going to do this again, please go right ahead. I'm going to just rush through this as fast as we can, so. Men at work. There they were. Where were they again? Cleveland, Buffalo, Gary, Chapman, Hart, were in a car one in one of the many semi-identical cities of the industrial Midwest, relying on the URI. The sky through the tinted windows was a gray slate, a sense of gloom hung in the air, which the president was determined to puncture. This kind of is as must bring you back, eh, chap? The vice president looked up from the binder papers he'd been studying and a sort of briefings in which the mayor liked which council member and which infrastructure project they'd stake their future on. He gave a thin smile. Well, it's been 30 years since I was mayor of New Orleans. She must be like riding a bicycle, you don't forget. The president trailed off. Uh, they rolled past an imposing, brutalist building. You know, that's why I put you on the ticket, the New Orleans stuff. A pause. I never had much executive experience before the presidency, but I knew you'd fill in those gaps with all the anti corruption work against the longs and all the rest. You always did what thought was, was right. It's kind of you to say, Phil Chep said, but I'm not sure that's how it was. It was Hart opened his mouth to say more, but the car reached its destination. He looked out to the building outside and then awkwardly to his vast present before giving half a apologetic smile. Oh, let's talk about this again later, Chep. We do have a cup of coffee here, too, to keep us nice and warm. I don't like that. Interstate 69 is at 0%. That's not good. 80% is at 69. Nice. 50, 95 is all over the place here. Oh, it's down here in Texas. Okay, well... But we're going to do that. Second checkpoint, thank you very much. And we'll let it build up and uh, remind Chep of his help. Yeah. Fill it up with... Oh. Heart isn't focusing on policy. Yeah, I won't be that anyways. Poverty beat. That'd be really good. Cooperative act. Um, fine clockwork. Ooh. Set yearly goals for the plans to improve the lives of citygoers. That'd be nice. Second yearly quota must conclude. Oh. Well, I guess we'll wait for that one. Catapult. It's working. It's really working. 
What this administration has dedicated the past few years, uh, their lives and brothers looked on into a formerly broken America and declared no more. From the empathy of Philip Hart to the bright smile of Chet Morris and to the stalwartness of Henry Ch Harry Truman. To the gracious mind of Jane Jacobs, each and every single person's cabinet is dedicating themselves to a hard cause and cause dedicated to Americans from every single corner of the country. To provide them a life better made. Made our life life made better. A home built sturdier, a city feeling safer, an existence more comfortable. That's it. That's the word. No more. Well, Americans shudder after the horrors they felt within the wicked triumph of Adolf Hitler, Hirohito, Mussolini instead. Americans could kick their feet up high, look out of the window, and finally, finally let up that held in breath they have been forced to hold in for the past two decades. By the president, I election season's over. You're going to go with that. Please go ahead. Yay. Candidates, voters, you've done America proud. Polls are updated, of course. Here's the new priorities. There's a uh, before but a year after she had originally proposed tracking the success of urban renewal initiatives via quota, Secretary Jacobs once again found herself knocking on the door of the Oval Office with a stack of papers in her bosom. President Hart ushered in, eager to be briefed on the results of last year's progress, had added in life, slowly but surely crime, homelessness, and poverty were steadily declining. declining. The future of America's cities appeared brighter by the day. After the briefing was over, President Hart took a moment to think. Old Madam Secretary, I must congratulate you for the work well done. This quota system will do wonders for administration and the PR both. Let's repeat it again this next year. Secretary no Jacobs nodded. Afraid to have to make the same decision on what to prioritize, this works again. We can make it a permanent fixture of the administration. Once again, President Hart needed to choose. Crime? I did it. I think poverty last time. And I, I, I love lowering poverty, like, so much. Crime is important to do as well. I do want to do catapult and get to the comments, but, like... Heart monitor... City quota failed. Oh. Well. Economy. Almost since poverty is still going up, crime is going up by quite a bit. We can still do poverty, too, though. Um... It's hard to read, like, exactly where we're at, because it keeps saying well, it's going to increase, but, like, where's our percentage? You know? So let's focus on crime this time. And we'll second the National Focus Catapults, of course. Um... Cool. But another comment was, do the duty ports before the old man dies. Someone else says, squeeze the lass out of heart. Um, someone says, I believe he can work as far as 1975, but that's it. His body fails him and dies in office. So at least that's what I heard on Reddit, so... Hey, we'll see, you know? I don't want him to die, but... Oh. And, hey, 1% is better than where we're at, but California dreaming. It was another day, another trip for the Phil Harp and his vice president. But they stood together, editing the president's speech of the California Chamber of Commerce. The speech concluded, or celebrated the role, of the URI in lifting up small businesses, reaffirming the president's support for enterprise in the free market. In other words, it was a banned or bland attempt to appease conservative voters. You'll want a couple of jokes at your expense, Phil. The Reagan chaps know you got a sense of humor. All right, clicked his tongue and scrawled a small note to himself on the margin. I'm sure I can find a thing or two to poke fun at. Maybe my complexion. He gave a wry smile that crinkled the papery skin. His papery skin. You know, Chip, I really cannot thank you enough for all you've done these past few years. You are a hack. I don't know if we could have made it without you. The vice president put his hand on his pocket flustered. Philip, you don't have to patronize me. We both know which one of us actually worked in Congress to. Hart waved his hand dismissively, fluttering the pages of the speech. You did plenty, more than plenty. There's a reason, like, Ike recommended you as a running mate. You can see Chip's mouth opening in surprise and push himself forward before the vice president could interrupt. I know what the gossip mongers may say, but you've done more for this administration than some senators. If it were up to me, they'd name an office building out of you. I really mean that. I love office buildings. There is a long silence of a man holding in his motions. Thank you, Phil. This administration is as much as yours as it is, is mine, Chip. Matters of the heart. Oh, boy. Of course, it's all very important. Without diplomacy, without allies, America will be adrift, outmaneuvered, and every turn by the agents of the right, foreign policy. As a center of the security of the free world, Henry Kessinger took another sip of the wine, staring at the table of, uh, uh, at, a, at his date. She, she was tall, just as he liked it. He, she gave him a small smile. It's good to hear that President Hart is so concerned about national security. Um, Kissinger waved a hand. The President, ugh, he's a good man, perhaps, but he's too idealistic. He has a lot of concept of what must be done to maintain a diplomatic standing. Take this recent leak, for example. These things just keep happening as long as the administration refrains from making hard choices. But those, but those hard choices are there for good of the country, right? As is his day, took another step of wine. Kissinger nodded. Of course, we are on the cusp of a definitive peace in the Pacific. Yeah, you know, love and war. Which one's next? 39. 79 to this one. 8. 94 is going to be next, probably. But, discuss the presence of the chat. Dealing with heart. Terminal cancer. Jesus. Cooperative Act 972. Which side do you want? We're on the side of the working man. Stop stop listening slowly to the corporate lobbyists and gifts and the working man, too. Our administration will not budge until it comes to, to the thousands of unions across the country and the millions of workers that make up those unions. Uh, and to ensure the cooperation of future administrations will attempt to pass the Cooperative Act. The resolution is standing on the side of the work no matter what one presiding over the 19, or 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. Death of a Statesman. Uh, today I began to fill up heart, leading to his lecture and microphone. We've mourned the death of a statesman. A man whose guidance allowed this nation to recompose itself in the wake of feet and take new posturing in world affairs. Er, that there is even in an organization free nations we owe to the late Harry Truman. Oh, God. Putting these sentiments into words, President couldn't help but feel how old... 
how the old haberdash had been sidelined in his administration. Pausing briefly, his eyes dashed between the bulbous t TV camera lenses as if peering at his obfuscated guilt. It was a long, lifelong public serving his devotion to statecraft is felt in the mutual confidence enjoyed by the United States and its democratic partners worldwide. The world's a safer place thanks to Secretary Truman. The eulogy did not mention President Hart's part in deceiving the age, his age foreign minister, nor take responsibility for the factionalism that racked the State Department instead. The President held his lip and yielded to the presentation of what felt like one final insult, that Harry S. Truman Senate office building so much for the legacy of the statesman. After delivering what felt like a uh, hollow closing remarks, a Philip Hart retreated into the Oval Office where Vice President was waiting for him. Those are some stirring remarks, I could, Sarah Morrison, but the President gestured at him for silence. I understand, minded Harry. Uh, confessed Hart, who kept his eyes downcast, I hoodwinked an elder statesman, and for the part of my accomplice, I am rewarding with a promotion. Hart's elevation got the press president off guard, who stupefied, sputtered, and in the search of his words, you can't before settling into long silence. Chip, what, would you have done the same? Probed Hart. The vice president said nothing. A victim of circumstance and ambition. Remove all foreign minister ideas from the United States of America. We don't need more. That's super good, huh? Wow. Cancer worsens. Oh, God. Avenue and a rainy day. President Harp and his VP Chet Morrison were on the hallway for the Oval Office while waiting staffers prepared for a visit from the Hill leadership. Even with nothing important on the docket, budget extensions, commemorations, the leaders still had certain expectations. They want to be treated well. You know, Chet began the president after spending time uh, starting a, a blue street with flags. I never really wanted this job. I saw a role in my myself in. I was happy in the Senate. Chet looked up from the bench. Well, he could have fooled me, Phil. I thought you'd taken the job uh, like a duck to water. The president continued staring at the oil painting and the splotches of people in umbrellas. It was Johnson that pushed me up. God, I remember the days before I announced I was so hard to put a ha hand to his withered face. Are you scared, Chep? <clears throat> the vice president was silent. How could words describe what he's feeling now? How could any man be ready to be thrust under the office to know that his ascension meant seeing a friend die? I don't know. I think my inauguration sometime, all those smiling faces, I think about how I couldn't let all those people down. I had to bottle up all my pain and my anxiety. I couldn't be a legislator anymore. I had to be the kind of man people wanted to delete. The president removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes. The pain blurred in his vision. I know you'll do the same, chap. I know you do what's right when I'm... The president felt a heavy hand on his shoulder. Everything's going to be okay, ma'am. Introduction of the Cooperative Act 1973. The critical block of the Hart Voting Coalition is the Labor Union. Walter Reuther has been a thankless ally in many of President Hart's congressional battles and now has been deemed the time for the favor to be repaid. The Cooperative Act, a resolution declaring the American government support for workers over employers, stands extreme circumstances. It's a big move slow to find the strong connection recently before between the federal government and the labor unions. The resolution is supported mostly, supported mostly by the Democratic side of the coalition with the company support from the progressives in the pact. Even in this bipartisan favor, the Cooperative Act faces serious hurdles. Conservative Republicans and activists are frothing at their mouth. Even announce a resolution supporters be borderline socialists. With well, encouragement of numerous powerful business executives from the sidelines, no matter the administration remains confident the resolution is better to pass, but its fate lies in the hands of Congress. To the floor. And it's done. As we do, discuss the transition with Humphrey. It passes. After continuous debates, uh, conti uh, continuous Debates from both in, in and outside of Congress, the cooperative resolution has become the Cooperative Act. Its accomplishment errors, or serves as a big break for the Hart administration and the local and labor allies, providing a critical pillar for support for employees, seeking litigation against employers as such industrial heartlands are now sing, singing the praises of President Hart and his Republican Democratic coalition, and union men are breathing with a bit more power. This union makes us strong. Industrial expertise increases. Nice. Oh, organized workshop in the street corner. That's cool. Like clockwork. Well... National testing standards. At least a hundred schools. Oh God, a life well spent. Optics will increase by twenty percent. Combat rural flight. I kind of want to do that one. Ambassador, happiness, and enduring coalition. Oh, that seems kind of cool. Well, I guess you can go to Japan though. The last time Henry Kissinger had flown to Tokyo, he had been spirited in the under the cover of darkness. But that's only been before he achieved the greatest diplomatic coup of the century. Now the Emperor's people rolled out the red carpet. The Japanese Imperial Guards marching band stood assembled before Marine One, playing a surprisingly stirring rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Kissinger and Takayuchi smiled and waved for the cameras before ducking into a limo. The limo sped through the streets of Tokyo, escorted by the honor guard on motorcycles. Kissinger looked out the window. Out of the cheering crowds, to tell you the truth, he said to Takayuchi, I would have expected more hostility. I even see a few American flags in the crowd. Takuchi shrugged. I suppose that a victory means that we do not harbor the same amount of resentment towards America, although there are exceptions. He gestured to the edge of the boulevard where some menacing looking men in the military uniforms had gathered, holding rising sun flags. Which Japan wishes to be left alone with its victory, but if America pushes too hard, those that want to march all the way to Washington will be emboldened. Kissinger nodded. I can only hope we can throw this needle. The final phase begins. This is it. To ensure the fruits of detente is upon us. Oh, we broke the ice. If you want to read about this again, please go ahead. Treaty port negotiations. Oh, Jesus Christ. The parade. American spirit. Um, 
The Japanese and Germans, when they can crack jokes about getting the Kenpai tie, others can stop on their butts before they say, I worship my head of state as if he was the Lord God himself. Love to make fun of American football. Ah, even the Canadians and Cubans do. In fact, easily 99% of the foreigners they know about football will run around making making fun of how it allegedly amounts to running around with an egg that never touches the person's feet. Thankfully, we in the White House don't stake our nation's honor over what American football is and is not. Rather, we prefer to express our pride in the sport with a far greater international reach. Baseball. Research has become clear to us that baseball can do with a far greater investment. We need that solution simple. Give it more funding. People have poisoned themselves with partisanship and paranoia. We need to incite them to lay down their cricket bats and pick up a baseball. Let them fight their, uh, for their local sports team rather than their darn old political party, and at the same time strengthen the bonds within their communities. Rain on my parade. I was raining in Washington, poor and even, standing beneath a tent uh, on the Capitol's east portico, though the park could barely make out the faces of a freezing about all the people below. A haze hovered in the air. But the president was determined not to let the weather get him down. It was good luck to have rain on your wedding day, so perhaps it was good luck to have rain on your inauguration day, too. Philip Hart spoke at great lengths about the virtues of liberalism, about how he had sought to advance his ideals during his first term. Shouting over the storm, he celebrated the work of the Urban Renewal Initiative. And the many men and women who had made it possible, he would go further and faster, faster in his second term, he promised. He would make good on the promise of American dream and prove that the Republic still so strong. No matter how many challenges America faced at home and abroad, there was no challenge that the people united in purpose could not overcome. The president finished his remarks for the benefit of the dedicated crowd below, gave an awkward smile and wave. He felt his suit shift around him. A little of his clothing had fit since he started cancer treatment, and the exposed part of the emaciated arm. <clears throat> he quickly moved to conceal it, and gave a bright thumbs up to the faceless crowd. He hoped his enthusiasm could hide the, his signs of illness, that no one noticed the thick makeup applied to his face. <coughs> Through the way, and there was a small cheer from the crowd. Philip Hart wobbled away from the podium and locked arms with his wife before retreating inside the Capitol. Good luck to you, President Hart. Passing the torch. Good to have you here again, Hubert, President Hart said. Looking through the Oval Office window, I wish we didn't have to have this conversation so soon, but I'm very, still very proud of what we accomplished in this country together. We could have done with all that uh, without your help. Oh, for not a flash of grief uh, breaking through the facade of the happy war. Thank you, Mr. President. We overcame a lot. I know that no matter what happens, future generations will remember you as one of the greats. He cleared his throat. Unfortunately, we can't spend all day reminiscing. Your succession is close at hand. Chep is going to need a VP of his own. Of course, Humphrey's words so hard, so it didn't feel real. Who did you have in mind? Well, we've got a few options, Humphrey said. Dad Kennedy's a liberal darling. We've been between this family name, the healthcare bill I pushed for. Uh, Bay, Birch Bay is a good middle of the road choice, and Leonard Woodwork, or Woodcock, would be excellent for doubling down an alliance with the labor movement. Hart shook his chin. I wouldn't want Kennedy. He does do too much good in the Senate. He met Humphrey's eyes. You know, Hubert, I won't accuse you of self promotion if you nominate yourself. Humphrey waved his hand, chuckling. Believe me, it's not modestly keeping me here. My work is still in the Senate. He shrugged. If Kennedy's out, then I personally think Bay is their best bet. Hart nodded in an agreement. An ordering of affairs and the treaty port negotiations. After I take a look at this. Um, which one? Walkable roads? I don't think it was roads, was it? Equality, more happiness. Better poverty. Happiness, equality. Yeah. Big boss mark. Generic depot. Purchasing power goes down, which I don't like. Organized workshop. More ma less managed man efficiency, more purchasing power. That's not bad. I don't know. I like the poverty stuff. At 1.1%, not great, 55 billion, though. The treaty board negotiations. The civil cabinet was silent, just digesting the contents of the proposal before him. President Hart surveyed the room, knowing the enormity of the moment was giving everyone pause. It's been 20 years since the end of the war, gentlemen, President Hart said. Uh, oh, look at that. Um, a decade or so since Eisenhower tore up the Akagi Accords and admitted it wide of the Union. Now it's their turn to finish where he started. The proposal to stand up to Japan at last and demand negotiations of the treaty ports of San Francisco and LA would be the most ambitious and consequential faction diplomatic initiative of the United States in their lifetime. The eyes of the world and the American electorate will be scrutinizing them under a microscope. There will be no room for failure, of course. The Japanese simply wouldn't fold, but it was clear that holding ports halfway across the world, a diplomatic nightmare, and impossible scale was increasingly unattractive. How much could America push without being pushed aside by Japan in return? It would take the political power of the American government to ensure the successful return of the ports, without giving away the house to Japanese in the process, but a few concessions here and there might be useful in making demands further down the line. Let's make history, gentlemen. Like in a new decision category for the Honolulu Accords. Political power pool, gains or losses, political parties, uh, depending on how much we uh, invest. We both use a system which ever superpower invests more political power will gain all political power from the pool at the end of uh, every clause. So now we're done with preparing for this. We could maybe even do this one too. Homecoming with Walter. No booze, I fly. Sometimes I wish I could just melt in the crowd. A hard thought to himself without sitting while sitting in the dugout. Glancing up, he saw a secret service agent give him a nod, taking a big old deep breath. Philip Hart stood up and made his way to the field. He knew what awaited him on the pitcher's mound. If it was lucky, there would be a mix of jeers and cheers. Most likely, only a chorus of angry Americans waited during this embarrassing spectacle. Four, the first pitch of the opening day. Please welcome the President of the United States. Also, if you want to do this uh, focus too, please go ahead. But Oregon music blared with a loud speaker and thunderous applause erupted across the stadium. Instead of sulking into the, the pitcher's mound, Philip 
uh, confidently saunter with baseball in hand, getting into position you wave to the crowd, then pitch to the catcher. When the baseball reaches his glove, the spectator cheer once again. Upon completing his short but sweet ceremonial pitch, Hart approached the catcher. They briefly shook hands, and the president disappeared in the bowels of the stadium. Now it's time to enjoy the quiet, the quiet of a luxury box. And, you know, we could try this. Dangerous liaisons. Let's see what it's like. President Hood stood with Walter Reuther on the Michigan tarmac, smiling for the cameras. Public relations were, of course, important, but Hart was still relieved when the press finally backed off, and uh, two men could get to talking in brass tacks. Mr. President, I'm glad you're here, Reuther said, because we have a lot of work to do. Detroit's a mess. Pollution is mucking up the living space of the workers. It's a problem that's been a lot of best for decades, and now the city's mocked up a disaster. Someone's got to change. Hart nodded enthusiastically. I completely agree. I've always been one of the for environmental policies. We'll turn this around. Reuther came to a stop. With all due respect, Mr. President, Ike, Kefalfer, Jack Kennedy, all said the same thing. You saying you'll change things doesn't mean it'll, it'll, it'll change. Our blank, uh, yeah, of course. Reuther started the walk again. I'm sorry, Mr. President, I got carried away there, but the fact is that the workers here are tired of hearing politicians promise. They'll change things. I know you're not just talk, but solving this issue takes more than good intentions. It's a complicated problem, and a lot of powerful people wanted to say it that way. Hart said his jaw nodded. Well then, Mr. Porther, I look forward to working with you to solve it. Porther smiled. The beginning of a partnership. 80%, nice. Still 0% for some reason. Ah. Jap the Japanese proposal, uh, some location. The President Philip Hart and Kissinger read through the diplomatic messages that arrived from the um, Japanese embassy again. Uh, they want to meet on one of the carriers in San Fran Bay, huh? Um, President Hart uh, laughed scornfully. I thought we did that already on the Kagi. This is close to home. We'll have an easier time securing messages to and from Washington if they're in San Francisco anyway. Here's some jumbled over the notes contents, though we can't rule out the risks of bugs of the carrier, and I'm not sure the Japanese will take kindly to the suggestion that we sweep their ship. Mm-hmm. President Hart nodded. We'll still be doing them a favor, meeting them on the ship like this. Any other options? Well, I suggest we come to one of our carriers. The voters would love the imagery. Kissinger replied, though I'm sure the Japan's Prime Minister would have the same concerns we have. Two pals up for a second. Maybe we should ask him if they'll be alright with Mexico City. We'll lose political power, thus investing more. Both Mexico City on neutral ground. We'll talk on their carrier. We'll gain political power, but less losing of our invested political power. Well, Americans have a counteroffer. Well, it's always seen bug. Gaining political power, but losing some of our invested political power. Weird. All of God's children, which I do want to do about the parade. Fiscal stimuli are frequently suggested during the times of economic crisis. And government pours money into this or that district or sector to ensure it stays alive, if not thrives, into the short and medium term. However, it's also been uh, that such fiscal stimuli can be used to seize the movement a uh, moment brought about by this or that policy to provide governmental support for fledgling socio-economic venture in which the states believes. This latter type of stimulus is what uh, is on the bill currently going through the United States Congress. Uh, communities and cities participating in the current urban renewal initiative will, via a major financial stimulus package, be granted federal backing in their plans to expand construction on local sites. Now, this could be brought about it was not only strengthen the local economy, but bring about vital cultural change in the exact direction America needs to occupy the Nazi and the Japanese menace. The summit is set. The Japanese just another agreement to their location. We'll go to go for the summit. A momentary look of relief emerged in the Kissinger's face before swiftly disappearing. I'll come to hard part, President Hart said. We better get ready for what the Japanese are going to want in exchange for giving our territory back. They want oil and they want access to our markets, Kissinger slid a folder to the President's desk. With everything that's been going on in the sphere, I can't say I blame him. President Hart smiled at least, and that gives us leverage. Making history one step at a time. Make sure to ice war. Roy turned to the president and stared out at Lake Michigan. It should have been beautiful, but the blue sky was still as smog and the waters were growing healthy green. You remember this early days, Roy Thur asked? We were both consumer advocates, weren't we? Always grinding and hustling for the people who needed us. Hart nodded. I think we needed some of that energy for the battles to come, he offered. In the interest of that, Roy Thur said, I wanted to meet with you today to talk about the first big blow we'll strike. I've been talking to Senator Nelson, you know, Gaylor, right? Well, the new bill we've been thinking of that can really make a dent in this pollution problem we've been dealing with. I wrinkled his nose and a car roared by and it's exhaust assaulting his nostrils. If it'll help me not have to smell that anymore, Hart said, I'm all for it. We're speaking the same language, Reuters said. That smells from the lead in the gasoline. Don't think I'll have to tell you that, but the lead's bad news. Gaylor's proposing to ban all lead and gasoline and impose limits on emissions. That work one is cutting down the smog. Do you have the Oval Office support on this? Hart gave what he hoped was a victor's nub. Where do we start? Or when do we start? Well, let's go look see. 70, that's pretty good. Never too much. Our money. New incentives. Buy and four. Chicken hawks. Rebuild on the bank, huh? That wouldn't be bad to do. Even though we're pretty much done with all this. Take a step back, maybe? Um. Something the budget. Well, no, we're good. We don't need to do that. Yes, yeah, that feels definitely bugged. Hmm. I like clockwork. Well, I'll we'll wait. Hmm. Is this one? At least 30 schools. Social welfare. 
Checked him by Adam's budget. You know, breaking the red bars on every map there are lines. They represent national or state borders, roads, rivers, or mountains. They come in a variety of blue colors, blue, green, yellow. There's one kind of line, however, that should not exist on maps in America's and President Hart's America. Red line. Red lining a holdover from America's racist, racist past is the practice of withholding certain services from neighbors or parts of cities that are deemed dangerous for those in charge of providing them. It's no coincidence, of course, that these lower income neighborhoods tend to be primarily African American. We must establish this unethical practice. And the Japanese demand more oil, of course. Mr. President, we have started negotiations with Empire of Japan about the potential acquisition of our California ports. One big problem between our nation and the co prosperity sphere is the fact that we do not trade enough. Because of this, the Japanese demand a substantial amounts of oil to make up for their recent shortages. Simply put, the sphere lacks many of the oil reserves that we have in the U.S. Luckily, the Japanese diplomats seem pretty desperate to sign a contract with us. And we're getting subsidized oil purchases. The county of the sphere will continue functioning may regain our lost ports. If we help out the Japanese and the sphere help, uh, helping us out, we can see a brighter relationship between the two great nations. We also have a chance of bringing American workers back to work for us. Now the question of the moment is how much oil will we get at the Empire of Japan? We can be generous and offer them the substantial amounts of oil that they need. We'll go down the middle and offer them a moderate amount of oil, but we could also give them small amounts, but may not accept the offer. We also need to consider what the Japanese plan to use the oil for. What do you say, Mr. President? Give them as much oil as possible, pretty much. Japan's curling lead, huh? Japanese want more. We received some unfortunate news, Mr. President. Japanese now request more oil than, than our highest initial offer. Our diplomats have tried to convince the Empire of Japan that our oil offer was the best we can give, but now they're demanding even more. We really thought that the Japanese would be better negotiators than they turned out to be, but it seems they were in the process of continuing this deal. Oh, concluding it. We've come up with three options for a response to Japanese demands. We either submit or rather extortion demands and continue. Uh, the feelings of goodwill, persuade the Japanese that our original offers was enough, and our end negotiations all together move on to the next topic of discussion. Your move, Mr. President. Terminate. Accept the new demands. Zip it, lock it. How many dead hogs does it take to make the world a better place? None. They didn't want to spend money on the exploratory, exploratory committee to brainstorm solutions. A rather unruly vo vocal minority is formed across party lines. They're concerned at the enormous pr the high price tag of our urban renewals costing us. That bring our ability to push benchmark bells or Congress to give them into these dead hawks would render our goals defunct. And it would make us lose progress. Therefore, we must work hard to make the dead hawks agenda difficult to attain. It might get dirty at times, but it'll be a necessity if we want our urban renewal uh, pact some punch. A complete success. The trade deal between the U.S. and the Empire of Japan is beginning or being finalized um, after days of proposal and communication. It seems like both parties are getting the resources they really need. The U.S. will have to support San Fran and L.A. return without conflict, and the Empire of Japan will be given an oil grant that will help them solve the widespread shortages throughout the sphere. The President and the Prime Minister of the United States of America and Japan, respectively, shook hands on the deal just moments ago. No matter what, both parties hope that these negotiations will be better relations between the two global superpowers. Workers of both California and the Japanese home islands rejoice as the nations announced the completion of the deal. Though the trade deal is completed, the diplomats of the U.S. and Japan still have work to do. Talks are supposed to carry on in the next few days, but one thing is for sure, there will be a peaceful end of these important negotiations. The negotiations worked. Ah, the credit of the bargaining table. President Hart sat in the Oval Office with a phone to his ear, not bothering to hide a smile on the face. President, Mr. President, what, uh, what can we do for you? Um, the sound of Walter Rother's face was voice was familiar to the President by now. Mr. Rother, it's calling to deliver some very good news. The bill that we're working on the Gaylord seems or sets looks set to pass both houses of Congress. It should be on my desk to, buy, to sign by tomorrow. Hearing himself say that made him smile. It was one of the small steps forward, but a better America for all seemed that much more in reach. And when I said I want you to be right there next to me, we'll show America that the labor movement and the Hart White House are working hand in hand for the people and the environment. We could hear Mr. Hear Reuters smile through the phone. I'd be honored, Mr. President. I'll be doing everything I can to promote the success of anyone to listen. We'll get this country pushing forward with us for a green future. And please call me Walt. The terms of a deal. The Japanese decision or delegation has put forward their proposal for the resumption of trade between our economies. While the terms they set forth to end the embargo seem fairly agreeable, they decided to tie the issue to that of the treaty ports. They demand they pay a hefty sum of money for the return of the ports and made a deal on their transfer of condition for the resumption of trade. While placating or placing this condition on what could have been a straightforward subject to resolve has outraged most of our delegation, with many calling for an immediate end of negotiations, Cooler has pointed out that the access to a vast Asian market is a price well worth the cost, at the very least. We should attempt to separate the issue and offer conditions for each resumption of trade. Your response be? Pay the ports? Or resume trade without conditions or not at all. Oh boy. So we're going negative 25. Zip it, lock it. Forever mitis. Mitis. American cities. That one. 
America is built on freedom and equality, is in their founding documents, of course, some American cities, however, do not reflect this honored tradition, whether it be because of the sickly legacy of slavery and segregation, or the less violent but still racist redlining and gentrification. Gentrification. There are still towns and cities all across the U.S. that are still starkly unequal for those of a different skin and tone or a variety of other things. Let's tackle this issue and rip out the weed from its root. Architecture that specifically elevates one group will be built. In Hearts America, all groups must be on the same footing. Everyone deserves the same reach of the American dream. Third clause. It's time to move on to the third and last issue, the treaty ports. It's obvious to everyone that no real approachment between our nations is possible without while the Japanese occupy the port of the American mainland. With all the threats that imply, and the Japanese have indicated their willingness to return to the ports. The specifics. As the transfer has been left to, to the end of the negotiation zone, this will be the last clause of our discussion. A few options for how we position ourselves to approach these final negotiations. Our bodies fear that a straightforward transfer will be perceived in Japan as a loss of face, and the politics of that perception must jeopardize the negotiations. To avoid this, they say we should offer to demilitarize the ports under transfer. By doing so, we'll ensure the Japanese have something they can point to as getting a return, enabling them to transfer the ports without appearing a week. Others in our administration might counsel or counsel a uh, different approach. The goal of the whole sum, they say, is to turn a page on relations with the Japanese, and that can only be accomplished if they, if they agree not to only tra port transfer but to demilitarize Hawaii. With the Hawaii Missile Crisis and all too recent memory, they claim that the asymmetry of mutual threat will soon cause the rise in tensions back to previous levels as long as the Japanese garrison uh, the island chain. The most hawkish council suggests that we can demand the demilitarization of Hawaii without offering to demilitarize it to person in return. According to them, it's the only solution the man in the street will accept, and that's the only way to prevent future resentment from more souring relations. What approach should we take? Reports and demilitarize islands with secure relations? We must demilitarize Hawaii before we receive reports. Whoever might do this. Nice. Our money? Modify, never too much. We'll do this one. It might be a pyrrhic victory, but we can scrounge together enough votes to force a bill through Congress. The bill is everything we dreamed of for public housing and multitude of subsidies, but dozens of contracts to build new affordable housing, money for much needed maintenance and overhauls. Now comes the bad part. We've unfortunately evoked the ire of the opposition. Dead hearts. Already angrily protesting on the floors of the House and Senate. All that matters, however, is the people know that we did this and hopefully will vote in the next election. Nevertheless, President Hart has acknowledged that politics is a tough game and that we finally claimed a small, hard fought victory. Agreement reached. After several long days and nights spent in negotiations, our delegations are allowed to inform us they have reached a comprehensive agreement with their Japanese counterparts. As they toast our success, our brightest policy experts are pouring over the proposed clause, perfecting wording, and ensuring consistency between the English and Japanese translations. Soon it will be time to sign. And not long after, we hope we will finally have our territory back. Our success in this clause bodes well for the outcomes of the whole summit. One step closer to a comprehensive treaty in Iberian delegation. Oh, Occupation Center Micro Square. It's unbelievable. Oh, crap. This is Washington. Another friendly Iberian delegation has arrived in busy Washington as per schedule. It's a diplomatic mission, the same as always, to improve relations, and therefore ties between the Democratic Iberians and the OFM. The currently still hidden motive of these visits and the increase of cordial responses or correspondence between the former despotic but German opposed Federal Union uh, and, and us oh, was clearly visible. The two combined peoples were likely wanting to draw closer to our alliance itself and from there join as an equal member. The possible or possibly very lucrative enterprise considering the strength of Europe still shrouded in darkness and a protective Far East, it, however, would not come without danger as the Germans have proven themselves in recent decades to not be very sensible folk, especially when reacting to foreign made stimuli. Our decision, therefore, is how to continue dealing with the Iberians, should we draw it uh, nearer, quicker, or only better relations slowly, but betting on the Iberians and not abandoning their current foreign policy towards us. Send them a cordial letter. Um, I do want to get this one quickly, too. Forever Mitos. Uh, or this one, too. Never too much. Yeah, that's what I really want to do. I like their namesakes. They march silently to circle their prey. They silently to circle their prey, waiting for opportunities. Uh, to strike. They move suddenly just under the waterline of the law, able to run their lives, but people need them. People need those loan shark. But making it easy to get a real loan from a real bank will curb the over-reliance on loan sharks and other shady figures that impoverished communities face. And thus solve two problems at once. They also play into the President Hart's banking reform, making banks more common and better staff, which will allow wealth to flow into the cities and into the pockets of those who have been previously denied it. Uh, tree Porch Return. Oh my god, look at that. Let's do that one. Uh, you know what? I don't want to do this one first. I want to do this one first. Introducing of the Municipality uh, Housing Act. With the introduction of the Municipality Housing Act, Secretary Jacobs' ambitious agenda faces the most daunting trial yet. This act will provide significant grant funding uh, to the municipalities for the construction, maintenance, and expansion of public housing over decades, supplying affordable housing to millions of underdeserved Americans while allowing local communities to claim their space from unscrupulous developers. As we expected, the budget hawks have been taking immediate offense to this bill, denouncing it as a bottomless pit of expenditure that threatens to forever cripple America's financial health. Senator Barry Goldwater has been particularly harsh with the critiques of it, labeling the plan as importation of Soviet style socialism um, into America's cities. Even Senator George Romney has been reluctant to support the bill, fearing the encroachment of potentially corrupt and out of touch municipal governments into the public sphere. 
I don't have to fall back to his allies in the Repo Democratic and scattered MPP Progressive Caucus while he tries to flip enough seats uh, to get the bill through. God only knows if it will succeed. Has Jacobs reached her limit? Mm, not yet. And the return. The announcement of the conference of the treaty between the U.S. and Japan been greeted with optimism in most of the country throughout the last week. Speeches were held and uh, the paper signed the promise of a more peaceful future seen in the last reality. And a profound sigh of relief has passed with the nation. A tension that has been followed by people for over 20 years has finally loosened its grip. Today, as the treaty ports in L.A. and San Francisco were passed back to American hands, the atmosphere shifted to one in celebration. All across uh, the country, everyday life has given way to the part, uh, parties, pulling the whole neighborhoods out into the streets in. Celebration. The biggest crowds of all have been seen in the treaty ports themselves. In San Francisco, uh, cheers from gathering throngs drowned out the voice of the Japanese ambassador as the translators of the last few Japanese flags was taken down and the stars and stripes hoisted in its place. The surprise was evident among all the Japanese as well as the sailors aboard the Chimu uh, Chai uh, Kuma found themselves cheered goodbye by the jubilant crowds. The scowls and jeers they had come to expect from Americans replaced by cheerful smiles and waves. Pictures of the uniform of Japanese smiling waving back to the crowds are now making the rounds on TV on both sides of the Pacific. Truly felt like a page has been turned on the U.S.-Japanese relations. The end of an era. Change American despair with American malaise. Hawaii becomes a military zone. Significant oil concessions, which sucks, but not that bad. We'll get one more proposition. Gain a lot of support over a great victory. Nice. And of course, we'll do never too much as well. And then the parade. Um, did I do this really? I think I did. Yeah, I definitely, definitely did. Introduction of the American Vest Act. The Urban Renewal Initiative is one of the most ambitious programs in American history. Its size, expense, has caused many potential cities to balk at participating. In order to guarantee local participation and compliance, America American Vest Act moves many of the program's costs to the federal government, keeping the balance of the books of cities relatively untouched or ineffective. The bill comes after. A considerable debate within the Hart administration, Vice President Chet Morrison succeeded to convince President Hart to support on the grounds that the federal government should not be sticking cities with an enormous bill from a federal initiative program. The America Invest Act thus scares the head to private stack and wants to survive the Senate before it can actually help anyone. Will America Invest? Well, yeah, maybe. The Municipality of Hack passes the uh, Senate. The vote's been counted and the Hart administration can finally breathe a sigh of relief. The Municipality Housing Act has passed the Senate on its way to President Hart's desk. Already citizens across the country are feeling relief that the municipal government will have the funding to construct and maintain affordable housing in perpetuity. Many have thought that the Secretary Jacobs' plan was doing bitches that would never get past budget hawks and representatives of the white suburban interests. Today, the naysayers have been proven dead wrong. America's city shall once again be places one can make a living in. It's a hard administration that makes it happen. Already hard, some opponents are making noise about shutting down public housing construction and contested sites. They may show until there's blue in the face about concerned citizens, but the president may rest easy knowing that the support of this program has in many municipal governments. A visionary's dream stands fulfilled. Nice. One more proposition. Good. Oh, Urban Wealth is actually calm now. And we're fulfilling your civil rights agenda. Alright. Well, let's go look see. The New York Depot, Organized Workshop. Huh. So, homelessness and management efficiency. Way more cost. Homelessness rate goes down. Happiness gets higher, huh? Well, that's interesting. Our success in the port transfer negotiations and with ease with which we reach an agreement left a uh, markedly friendlier tone of the summit. Our delegations were marked on the surprising willingness to the southern Japan to discuss territorial religion and a co find a compromise in the East Pacific. Together, this provides us with an opportunity to too good to pass up. Well, most of the treaty ports safely agreed upon us time to open discussion. One last question, the return of Hawaii. In order to get them to even consider the transfer, we must be prepared to give them important concessions in return. Our advisors believe that they might ask for a joint or neutral admi administration of the Pan Panama Canal. Extensive arms limitation concessions are both. Regardless, it might be a good price we should be willing to pay. Securing Hawaii would be a fantastic achievement for governments and for the U.S., but beyond that, it would cement this treaty as the end of the era of hostility between us and the Japanese. The last core U.S. territory still occupied by Japan, its return will mark a true end of the war in the minds of the public and help usher in a time of peace in the East Pacific. Submit the proposal, and of course we're going to continue doing this one, but we do want to do this one as well. New incentives. These days, our administration is being treated to the resurgence of one of the most annoying, not to mention dangerous, talking points that a modern American government has to cope with. Large groups of people, especially social and fiscal conservatives, are complaining that President Hart's program so disincentivizes people from working because they can instead rely on the government to give them money. They spread panic about welfare queens and lazy homeless bums in order to support their unrealistic realistic viewpoint. They even saw the fact that this is not how things work. The cities and their funding must be defended unless the budget hawks tear them up bits while we aren't watching. We must make sure that these naysayers, especially ones within a governing coalition that the Hart administration and no one else, has brought cities from rags to riches specifically because of the strength of American labor. Round 2. No days... Not days after the riot of celebrations in L.A. and San Francisco, the foreign minister returned to Washington, D.C. under President Hart's personal invitation. The f visit's official intent was a tour around the American capital, a show of goodwill capitalizing the momentum of the now-named Hanover success. 
Unofficially, while the old man had super suspicions, he thought them confirmed when he entered the Oval Office and saw the President, back turned, expecting a large canvas on the map of Hawaii. The minister drew in a sharp breath as he took a seat, stealing himself for the last conversation he would ever wish to confront in his career. I trust the accommodations have heard to your liking, the President Hart asked without glancing back. The foreign minister grunted in assent, not as if the proper decorum, but he figured the silence was meant the President didn't care. <clears throat> Good. Leather shoes clacked with polished linoleum. As the president shuffled back to the rest of the desk, pulling several folders out of its cabinet, he spread the stack or stack across the surface like a dealer with a stack of cards. Each folder bore a proposal in red capital letters across the tab. What do I want to keep it from seeing the side, so I'll keep this brief. We've got some ideas from your government's consideration. We'll discuss these more later during your stay. As quickly as he had arrived, the minister left the office escorted by his assigned guide. When eventually he inspected the president's ideas in printed form, he was drawn to the most unconditional retrocession of the Hawaiian Islands to its all right government as it should so we'll do this one we'll do this one at buy and four what's the point of producing all this fancy new equipment if we just ship it off to another country never to be seen again no cities that produce appliances and tools should be encouraged to use them without within their very own cities even just for efficiency's sake made in america is hugely important of course but used in america is even more so local use and production is almost important as well it should not have to be sent to some central warehouse in idaho in order to be shipped back to the city from which it came a city that needs it President Hart argues that the process of transporting this much-needed equipment from producer to consumer should be streamlined rather than relying on existing and quite antiquated system. It must be built from the ground up. Call Bluff. Let's hear the good news first, President Hart said of the Situation Room. Kissinger spoke up unprompted. If there's one, then it's that Tokyo didn't shut the whole thing down right then and there, after a beep. He added, my colleagues in the Prime Minister's cabinet are sensibly convinced him not to. That just means the Japs didn't roll over the slightest touch, sneered the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Hawkish eyes scanned the Secretary from top to bottom, as if searching for excuses to exploit. I'd have thought that counts as bad news. It means the Empire is willing to stick with what we've negotiated thus far, despite I may remind you that people's wishes may be its own government's. So that's really the bad news, then. Cut to the chase, Mr. Secretary. Where do you stand? Really? Us or them? Gentlemen, the President's chastisement broke through this long summering argument, tampering it with the dignities or, uh, his office afforded, having prevented accusations of treason from being action. Or, uh, he ordered the Secretary to back out of the negotiations himself, America sticks to the plan. Agree to the Empire's lenient terms. Ocean oh, pacified. American Invest Act passes the Senate, of course. Applause rang out through the Senate as the American Vest Act received the final vote necessary for passage. A bill will now be shuffled across Washington to be signed by the President for a great victory for his administration and the URI. It's important right now for American cities as it guarantees that their budgets remain in their own hands, not crushed beneath the cost of the URI's projects. Urban renewal is a cause for good, and this law cements that with the federal government's law guests. The urban world blooms brighter. $20 billion. Jesus freaking Christ. Oh, we were doing so well. Frock. We were doing so well, my friends. Good lord. Good lord. An ocean pacified. The Pacific Ocean was all a Pacific even before the Second World War. Great pirates passed and offered at least a stick of kindling to the hearth. Fires below the large cauldron soaking its waters to even in, to an even simmer. Not too hot that its riches cannot be plumbed, nor too mild that I may all freely say their greed with them. This delicate, almost genuinely balanced a shadow in the role of bear witness. Two. Uh, uh, <clears throat> boiling seas in a sunset stronger than the day it sung. And as mushroom clouds have ended one age and announced the next, many fear the Pacific will forever stay between Twilight and Armageddon, and kept in place by two ambitions greater than the expanse which they both contest. Such fears were laid out today by a pair of disheveled ambassadors, but all bracing each other's inter innervated weights as they hobbled out of a hotel room. Against camera flashes and microphones, a hand lifted each paper bearing two signatures from the governments of the two great nations. Murmur and speculation diffused throughout the gather paras. Perhaps before the sec weary Secretary of State, pride opened the Foreign Minister's sake bottle with bare, bare teeth, draw out it half its vigor, and let loose an emphatic prophetic cry, peace in her time. We get Hawaii back. I thought we couldn't get him back. Get a ray of hope, huh? And Japanese and American tensions will decrease so much, it'll be negative 15. I guess I should probably prepare my resignation as well. Um, discussions. Well, you know what? We can save as well. Hopefully, we're not going to resign immediately. But also, I've got those temp files. Um, this worsens. Well, we'll draft his resignation. So allow him to resign at any point. All right, well, let's do it. And then we can resign. it will be chaps from now on. We'll resign from the presidency. Twa. He looked over the statement once, twice, thrice, thrice. Part of them wanted there to be something wrong, some catastrophic mistake, some reason to delay before the, say, the nation, and reading of the contents of that page, for standing before it. But there was none. It was perfect. So he had to face it. Tomorrow he would make the speech announcing his intention to resign the President of the United States, the first to do so since Nixon. These were his last days as leader of the free world. Well, maybe not yet. 
No, he, he wasn't ready. There was so much he wanted to do. He wanted to serve out the rest of his term. He wanted to see the legacy of bigotry stamped out for good. He wanted to see all Americans living happily together in a country that truly lived up to his promise. He wanted to see the work of so many Chip and Jane and Jean and George and Henry brought to fruition. He wanted to leave the White House on January 20th, 1977 as a president who had won. He wants to see his children grow to become the people he'd raise them to be. He wanted to walk each of his girls down the aisle to be there for the, his boys when the time came to teach them how to be men. He wanted to grow old with Jane and tell stories to his grandchildren as they played on his knee. He wanted to die at a ripe old age, surrounded by those he loved. He, crap, it wasn't fair. He wanted to spend the end of his presidency laughing with friends and family, drinks in hand, reflecting on what he'd accomplished, but instead he was sitting alone, a tear streaming down his face. And there was only one thought going through his head. Why? We're building the bank. In the days of the cowboy sheriffs and gold rushes, the town's post office was the most important building within it. Part bank, part meeting house, they were often the first part of the town constructed for, or in other cases, the towns would simply spring up around them. They were the center of the old western towns, often both literally and figuratively. President Hart wanted to return to the echo of America's past. By once again allowing post offices to function as banks, we could solve a lot of problems presented to us by other private banks. Not every town is wealth or affluence for one of the fancy private banks to set up shop, but every town simply by necessity. That's the post office. In addition, having these banks be federally mandated will allow us to crack down on any sort of discriminatory policies taking place. Nice. Everyone else is just calm. Hey, 70%, 88%, not bad, 88.5. Very nice. New incentives. Oh, fill apart. I think I have a feeling we'll probably end the campaign in the next episode, but we'll see. By and four, of course, we read all that earlier, too. Chicken Hawks. Over the past few years, the Hart administration has done quite a lot to irritate the various sword dead hawks in the United States Congress and civil society. The scream about this or that program has become so frequent that the administration simply ignores it as background noise in the Beltway flap du jour. However, despite what some might surmise from this, we are not completely inattentive to them. In fact, we have developed an ability to tell several types of them apart. Some budget talks have just hate spending, period, and stand no hope of being convinced. Others, however, are mere budget contrarians, hence why they just get called chicken hawks at the time. Rather than just generally shouting about waste, these individuals say, don't waste money on it. A, spend money on B instead. By definition, therefore, these fellows are far easier to deal with than their hardline compatriots. Let's make some concessions to calm them down. We can give them an earning report or boast about the sustainability of the programs and that we have implemented. Between these, the fiscal contrarians will be shut up well and finally for a good time. While we have our detractors, nothing that simple chat can't remedy. We'll leave some of the most critical voices to try and turn a new leaf. We get raw. Stability starts at home. Today, we'll completely misappropriate a quote of the Turkish president, Kemal Ataturk, who said that his policy consisted of a peace at home and the peace in the world. Though we believe that in time, or believe in that in the sense that he and his Republican people's party meant it, we also believe in it in a different sense that, as it were, closer to home. The benefit of any person, no matter their origin, to compete in the world relies on what they call home. Those with happy and prosperous households, regardless of wealth, for wealth alone does not make true prosperity, tend to have a far more advantageous and a trajectory than those with a broken home life. With a stable home life, one is enabled to face the world with strength, and it is our duty to cultivate a city, a nation, where the, it is available to all. If things will work, the USA becomes known as the place that has successfully nurtures its children. The whole world, even the egomaniac genocidaries, genocidaires, and Germania and Tokyo, will be forced to look at us for an example. Raw, meeting with some conservative leaders, obviously they have grabs with the budget, but Jane Jacobs has advised President Hart to a meeting before the meeting to not to concede. How do you leave the meetings? Here you're not happy about my budget. Why don't you talk to you about my agenda? Let's talk about the rights of man. You guys don't have a great track record, but maybe you can pull something off of the outlet of Elgo Grease. All for music, please support me. Should I avoid talk? Yeah. Talk about the agenda and those to complain about the budget, probably. Wait, oh my god, the year release plus is really bad. Oh, we're we'll be running deficits. No. That's not bad. Oh, we're still running a deficit. Jesus Christ. Army expenditures? Well, so much for the military. Goodbye, tanks. Goodbye. Can't afford you anymore. I'm sorry. My god, that's so much spending. Buy and four, and then with all of God's children. Uh, I think it was before. What's it gonna do buy and four? Um, so. There it is before, I can't remember. Simple fact that some people are just more vulnerable to society's great ills, homelessness, drug abuse, and crime than other folks. It's a tragedy of the human condition, but it's part of it nonetheless. What isn't a fact is this inhumane notion that we should leave these people, our fellow man, to the wayside to rot in the churning dustbin of obscurity while we press on. What sets America apart from the Nazis is that we are not a nation built on callous greed and murderous hierarchy, to, to be sure. We know that a part of our nation suffering and choosing not to do anything about it is murder. That's a choice, don't fool yourself. 
My presence soon will have a cruel one. Senators and congressmen will want to talk about getting people off welfare. What better way than increase it until the baton passes and our thriving job market can generally uplift people from destitution? Just do things. It helps their economy bound to new heights, but also allows us to spend less on welfare once their huddled masses have finally taken the liberty they so yearn for. So. In action. Over the past few years, the Hyde administration has done quite a lot to irritate the various assorted debt hawks in the United States Congress and civil society. They're screaming about this or that program. At times, it's motivated by covert or overt racism or fear of losing some precious privilege of theirs has become so frequent that the administration simply ignores it as background noise in the beltway at Plat du Jour. At the time, deadheads are foaming at the mouth like so many rabid raccoons because of the recent proposal to relieve some seeds of the financial burdens that URI expansions are putting on them. Rather than forcing seeds to bear the burden of the loan, this proposal will transfer some of it to the government at a fair competitive rate. Fiscal hardliners took a look at this proposal and see blame financial waste and adventurism, but they are, as always, flat out wrong. There's no choice for us but to move quickly to protect these cities from bankruptcy. Otherwise, the spending we have in Washington directed to them or to earmark will do them in. The growing pains of the new American cities will deserve our full attention. Our only an irresponsible fool or ill will villain would ignore them. Introduction. The Urban Committee Act has been introduced to Congress by leading members of the Republican Democratic Coalition. The bill proposes splitting the bill on the URI's costs between the cities and the federal government with our option for debt relief. The bill supposedly comes following major lobbying from Vice President Chet Morrison, who argued that fiscal responsibility required cost sharing. While some mayors have complained that increased costs, most are very happy to have the federal government as partner guaranteeing many of the costs. Now, the bill must survive the center of the cities will be in deep trouble. Let's see what happens. Except more surplus. Okay. Whew. Just tax the hell out of them. Lamp posts. Midnight basketball. Local youth targeted activities, funded and prompted by people from the communities in question, will keep youth that, that are out late on the streets from doing malicious things born out of poverty. If an inner city kid is out with his friends making themselves practice his feints and triple threats for the midnight basketball game coming up next Friday, he'll be too busy to sample drugs or harnesses or harass his classmates. If someplace else the young man has forced his nose into uh, a book because the janitor keeps beating him every which way in evening chess clubs meetings and he wants to try and leverage Fisher or Caleb. Capa Blanca's tactics to try to regain his honor? Well, I have absolutely no time to try any of these life ruining substances, or yes, yet, to, worse yet, to sell them. It's really quite simple. The youth just have to be out late on the streets, as best as it would be with other playing harmless games and growing that way, rather than being corrupted into learning things that will send them into the cold grave far sooner than just for kids their age. Urban Commitment Act passes the Senate. City governments across the country release excited press uh, releases today. Loud on the Senate's passage of the Urban Commitment Act. The bill, already on its way to be signed by President Hart, offers a bright picture for many American cities. With the federal government assisting with many of the costs in the URI, city budgets will not undergo major pressure or accrue significant debt. The URI can only succeed so long as the cities withstand the fiscal pressure, but with this bill, that should no longer be an issue. President Hart and his administration can rejoice at a bright future for the country in his own flagship project. A real partnership is formed. Up cost of upkeep will increase, or not even decrease, or happiness will... Who cares? Okay. <laughs> Alright, whatever. 153 days left. Oh, Jesus Christ. They put, wait, put in the bill. 37. They went. Urban Wealth is, went down again. Bruh. Especially it goes up. Probably still getting worse. Uh, so wait and see, I suppose, but still. Lamppost? Since the early Greek and Roman times, lampposts are streetlights and some of the officialistic pedants, pedants like to call them. Have a look. Been a tool of great use to civil society and state. Whatever unnamed ancient genius came up with the idea, immediately saw results. The new contraptions let roads well enough where people had a clear path from point A to point B at night with a reduced risk of coming a cropper uh, or being attacked without prior notice. Here's a path we find ourselves in a far different time and place for the first users of the lamppost, yet their use in that of lighting on the streets in general remains obvious. If a street is dark, crime proliferates, injuries are frequent, and surveillance is rendered ineffective. If the street is well lit, none of these are the case. Lampposts are cheap. While tested and easy to solve, it's asinine for us to not move quickly on getting them implemented. Pretty much, man. We still have race ride things, but not really. What we do, but not really. Lampposts. Uh, uniquely American. Toss a dice. Now that the Hart administration has dealt with public housing, it's time to go after housing itself. The last vestiges of segregation can be seen in the housing market. Whether it's the act of realigning the urban wealth actively pa pestering their towns to keep minorities from moving in, we'll focus on our efforts to overturning these subtle acts of racism and make sure every American has an equal opportunity to live in the community that he wants to live in. Maybe not feel bad, but uh, so has every other challenge this administration has taken on as well. You know, I kind of, I have a, this is probably a bad idea, but I have a feeling we're not going to be involved in any more wars across the world, and I'm probably wrong about that, but bye bye. We didn't need a military, right? Right. Uniquely American. 
There's uniqueness to American racism that makes it extremely hurtful and fun. It's mundane, it slowly saps away opportunity from inner cities. It's the scene of the black soldiers who step up to liberate the oppressed people of the world and come home to a country that forces them to sit in the back of the bus. It's seen in water fountains, concerned parents who don't want their children going to school with people of different colors. We have handicapped the racism grip in the South for generations, and with a little more effort, we can keep it down for good. Way too. When a tsunami recedes, it only comes back stronger. The same can be said for urban renewal projects. We gave them some time for the first wave to yield results, and now it's time to send in the second wave. New loans, more bike lanes, improved public transport, trees, trees, and a few more trees. Whatever city needs, we will provide it. Housing, zoning reform? We'll go the extra mile and give juicy contracts to construction companies, and we'll make sure the American city will be the envy of the world. Oh. Nice. Urban renewal expansion will be presented in the Senate to be voted on. Pawn. Nice. Well, 63.459 billion, you know, it is what it is. Army expenditure should be like nothing. That's been a little better now already. Anyways, 30 billion? Hey, what percent? Not bad. Oh god, less than 100 days left, huh? Introduction of the Urban Renewal Expansion Act. Up until now, the Urban Renewal Initiative has not reached even a fraction of America's urban population. What well, are the pilot programs? <clears throat> Established by the Hart administration has shown promising results. It's now time to implement the president's agenda across the nation. The Urban Renewal Expansion Act will drastically expand the scale and budget of the initiative, enrolling all incorporated municipalities in the United States. The lion's share of the urban renewal efforts shall be directed at America's blighted megapoly, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and St. Louis. These were once a beating heart of the American civilization, and a heart's watch that shall become so again. Naturally, uh, the act has quickly become the enemy number one for the president's opponents. Millions of voters in white suburbia view this efforts with suspicion, and many senators in the NPP's National Caucus have stoked these fears for their own political gain. The president has marshaled as much of his political capital in the Senate as he's able to, too, reaching out to both the RDC and the progressive members of the NPP in order to get the bill through the door. The stakes could not be higher, for a defeat here could bring President Hart's entire agenda crashing to the ground. The failure is not an option. I read this before, so if you read this again, please go right ahead, but the right stuff. Janie, to no resolution. Frankly, in the field, electricity is a beautiful thing. Late night TV, electric stoves, microwaves, these are the things that Benjamin Franklin could only dream of as he held that lightning rod on the stormy night 19, uh, 19, 1752. Today, the Hart administration will bring these dreams to fruition for millions of rural Americans not connected to the power grid. Rural America will no longer be deprived of that creature, comforts, that technology. The Urban Renewal Expansion Act, of course. Why would it not? Passes the Senate. After a long, intense roll call, a verdict has emerged from the Senate. The Urban Renewal Expansion Act has passed. Cheers have erupted among the crowd that's gathered outside the Capitol as the news has spread throughout the nation. No longer will the Hart administration's urban renewal initiative just be another dream could find a few pilot programs, but show no compass every municipality in the nation. Long suffering inhabitants of America's inner cities now have a bright future to look forward to as the decades of urban planning and its policy shall be rewritten. Urban renewal is common whether the president opponents like it or not. And it's like it they shall, for the bill's passage has already provoked an uproar among the self-appointed representatives of middle America. The MPP's demagogues are now pledged to assemble a coalition of concerned citizens against President Hart. Unfortunately, their rhetoric may find fertile ground for the many well-off Democratic voters, and the suburbs are now beginning to question which constituencies the party truly serves. It's not an end, but only beginning. The bonuses from the Urban Renewal Initiative are double, including the drawbacks. And a daring dream uh, is increased. So... Let's go look see... <laughs> Walls is social security and healthcare reforms, huh? And then education reforms as well. Reforms. So, well, effective civil rights legislation, military austerity, significant oil concessions. I mean, obviously, it's America that really does nothing for us. Um, what is this? The industrial arm. Oh. High unity, which is good. Ambitions of a political machine. Oh, boy. Social welfare. Look at all the stuff we have here. Penal system policy monthly rate. Needed consumer goods. Social program cost factor. Oh, God. Doesn't look like it's doing that much for us. Construction speed is nice, though. This is South Town, military advisors, bat, last bastion of liberty, of course. So only 35%, which kind of sucks, so. Domestic revolution? Sure. Uh, the halls of MIT, Rutgers, at Texas A&M, hunches colleges across the country. The students of science are making breakthroughs. One field of study making strides is agriculture, much to the pleasure of the American farmers. Each harvest provides access to better equipment, seeds, and fertilizers than the last. As such, there's not likely a relationship between the humble farmer and August uh, academic is one that the hard administration is interested in fostering. Franklin in the field, of course, I read this one last two, uh, or before we fade and pad out, so that'd be nice. You get a lot of thermoelectric plants and building slots, but still. Bastard for the second America. Jim Morrison is a good man, able to address the issues of all Americans. Yeah, he was not born with this skill. During his tenure as Louisiana governor, he learned how to meet the demands of both Bayou and Bustlin Urban Center. Jeff has graciously offered up his skills in statesmanship, uh, in statesmanship to communicate or with all corners of rural America and deliver what they need most from our administration. Thread and needle. 
Fertilizer seems pretty straightforward, no? Wrong. Fertilizer is fan, freaking fantastic, and it's only getting better. Scientists are innovating boring old fertilizer to produce results we've never seen before. Meaning a farmer can yield uh, or, or spend less to produce even more crop yield on the harvest. It won't force to take time to catch on, no big deal. It'll be widespread use by the next election cycle, right? That's all that really matters, right? Elections. Um, through an increased investment in the agricultural sciences, uh, we'll put America on the front lines of scientific breakthroughs in the field. Sure. As we were saving, of course, a little bit more as well. Look at all how much energy we have right now. Holy crap. Ambassador for the second America, of course. Checks and bu balance budget. Spend more money? Might as well. Dead hawks, ball busters, real pains in the butt. Like clockwork, they are fiscally responsible. The Congress have swooped down for the purchase of peccavator policies. They're especially eyeing a rural budget. It's obvious why the hard administration doesn't deliver on its rural promises. Rural America will have to flock to his opposition. It's a necessity to ward off those who wish to cut down our ambitious policies. Our ammo is political capital. I'll expand it, expand it to protect our policies, of course, because why wouldn't we, you know? Why would we not? Thread, and of course, that there needle. What do we got over here? Oh, God. 25 days. Oh, Jesus. Let's get fairs and orders. My stall's on Jenny sure he doesn't die with him. I guess we're going to resign, I guess. Might as well. Temp tax hike. Military will probably really, really do nothing. Oh god, 19 days. Uh, four days left. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, this is, this is tight. You know what? I'm going to click on it anyways and see what happens. Resign. Uh, but I want to do all this stuff still. 14 days? How many days do we have left? But, oh, we don't have time for it, do we? We don't. Oh, god. You know what? We'll resign. Oh, the decisions go well. We must do it. Prepare the cabinet for its inevitable departure. Uh oh, what comes next? Oh crap! Well, oh well. It appears to hard that at such a moment like this, the first thing he could do was to think about the sun shining in his eyes. It was a bright and sunny day in the rose garden. The podium he stood at the surrounded with vibrant flowers. The poor sweating in the suits with new pads in hands, and the light of all things was forcing him to quit. Uh, squint. On any other day, he'd enjoy the weather. Right now, he'd have to make do. Good afternoon, he began, and then he found something he couldn't stop. They're all very busy, men and women. I'll still make this announcement as quickly as I can. I'm an older man, and like many of us, I have my health issues. My arm's been hampered since the Second World War. I've had my share of the cost and sickness, but my hair's gotten grayer with every year that goes by. But I'm here to let the American people know. Now the press is perking up, he thought, pausing and collecting himself. Know that I've been diagnosed with terminal melanoma, of which treatment has failed. A wave gasped went over him, forcing him to grip the podium a little tighter, following the that was the rattle of the camera snapping and back into focus. He straightened his posture, blinking once or twice, staring straight ahead and continued. America deserves a strong and functional executive. Thus, I'll resign my office in some weeks' time for the capable hands of my vice president. Well, no, it will serve you well. It's been my greatest honor of my life serving this nation, but I thank you all for the support and kindness which has been bestowed, bestowed upon me. Words can never sum it up. Thank you dearly. Now the questions came, but they were nothing more than a loud and jumbled mass to be soon be ex-president. He stepped back from the podium, turned and walked straight back to the door and into the White House and race. Were those tears or was it just a light? Bruh. The not so prim prime time news. Winds from the northeast threatened to bring in another thunderstorm for the weekend, so plan ahead, people, while you're vacationing away inside. Let our Washington man, Ben Hask, clue you into the storm in Washington instead. Ben, thanks, Dave. Well, big news from the Beltway today, as you may have already heard, the president announced his cancer diagnosis earlier this morning. We at Channel 8 News wish President Hart a speedy recovery, and we will make sure that the Hart family is in our prayers. A second quiet passes. Not long after, Senator Edward Kennedy, to reports outside the Capitol, said the president did great work and I'm excited to carry on his legacy. Critics are opposing a politician's voice that is content with the senator's remark, claiming it's disrespectful towards the president, implying that President Hart is now incapable of performing presidential duties. This in addition to claims that it was just an attempt to jump in front of the 1976 Democratic primaries. In response to the backlash, Senator Kennedy put out a statement saying that he's heartbroken and personally affected by the president's cancer diagnosis, and they should have responded with more tact. Thanks for the rundown, Ben. You know, aren't the president and Senator Kennedy friends? I thought they were. Maybe they were missing some contact, said Dale Bentley, loosening his journalistic professionalism. He's been in the business long enough to know that most people have stopped watching by now. I believe they are, Dale. Regardless, you have to admit that this was a bit of a kerfuffle. A mildly tickled smile passes over the face of the anchors. I've heard rumors that the president laughed upon hearing about Kennedy's debacle, but I refuse to support that as a fact at this point. We'll have to wait for some kind of statement. Fair enough, Ben. To more lighthearted news, I believe Maureen has a special guest for us. Politics just never stops. SSSR, SSR, Osprey Senior, going about this, please go ahead. He's waiting for the next news months. Happy 1974. We didn't, he didn't make it in 1975, but he did pretty darn well. Do the president. 
I've never written to a politician in my entire life. I not think I would pick up this happen up now, but after learning your condition, I believe it is a Christian thing to do. I send all my condolences and prayers to you and your family. You're a good and decent man who does not deserve the condition which you have, and I pray that you overcome it. From a guy in Boston. Letter from Henry R. H. 5. Be okay. He held it for a long time. He doesn't know what to do with it. I cannot thank you enough for the work with which you have done in the last years. I remember in the 60s, always being scared that my kids might get hurt, my, my, my wife might get mugged, or I couldn't rake, make rent, or my bills would be too much. Now I have a new car, a new home, my kids have places to play, my wife can go to the store without being scared, a, a person from California. I'd like to tell your family that all of us here are cheering for you and pray for the best. Whether you change your mind about the presidency or not, you've been a great senator for us and a great president too. I know that they'll talk about you as the best or say it has to offer in history. A woman from Grand, Ma Grand Rapids, Michigan. I do not vote for you in 60 and do not vote for you in 72, and on the whole, I'm not particularly in agreement with the direction you have taken this country and the lack of care for those beyond the cities. However, I'm sure that you're a good man at heart, and I deeply and firmly believe that you have done what you believe to be the right thing for our nation, and I respect you for that. Keep these forever. Well, he's dead. I didn't get my roads done. Oh, we got four roads done. Four highways done. God dang it. That's still 0%. This is totally bugged, man. We're still buying and electrifying this. I mean, it takes a long time. Oh, God. We failed. We failed. Oh, God. Oh, God. What happened now? Someone's got to know. Last call. Oh, shh. Sh Nikes. Chip Morrison looks really weird. Um. Oh, last call. Good evening, the president began speaking to the cameras now. He squinted at the lenses. He could practically see the Americans glued to the TVs, families in living rooms, and around kitchen tables, perhaps disagreeing on their opinions for their views, but all knowing that they were watching history before them. Later, be told the number 100 million. 110 million. He wondered if through the makeup of the lighting, they could just see how tired he was. I've never been one for the television address, so I've only gone through with him when the matter was a matter, matter of national interest. This, of course, is one of those times. Some weeks ago, I announced, or a few days ago, I announced my cancer diagnosis and my intention to resign. By noon tomorrow, the transfer of power shall have taken place. Words flowed like him, by him like water as he spoke. Taking the pain he always carried out with a tide occasionally. He picked out a sentence of what he was saying. Our urban renewal has breathed life into our cities. Our students enjoy the best education in the world. Vice President Morrison has the courage and tenacity necessary to fight for us against authoritarian menaces without our national issues with him. But it felt all hazy, like a dream or maybe a nightmare. Dreams are never fulfilled him with so much uncertainty, but nightmares didn't feel so relieving to go through. In a few short hours, I will leave my post for the only title more honorable and more prestigious that exists in our nation, Citizen. We citizens of these United States are brought together by qualities far greater than those which divide us. Through our wisdom and the grace of God, we shall see these times soon emerge into one of our worldwide liberty of international democracy and a pride in our nation and people and ourselves. He paused for a moment, then fixed the camera angle again with a gaze, one of regret, of worry, but most of all, acceptance. It's been the greatest honor of my life to serve in this office. Thank you, and God bless America. A fitting end for a decent man. Someone's got to know. Morning rain padded. The asphalt and concrete of his parking garage, a quiet place for those ambitious journalists and other anonymous sources to meet and share their secrets. Tom had been one of those anonymous sources before, nor had he ever been inclined to be, but it was back in normal times. The times were now decidedly not so. What else would he be smoking out the window of his Lincoln, fervently gripping the folder like it was gold? He nearly jumped on the contact, tapped on the passenger window, opening the door and slipping inside. A woman from the WAPO named Helen a bit older than him. They both seemed to stare at each other for a moment before Tom shoved his folder into her hands. What is this, Helen said, flipping it open and skimming the pages? Look, you gotta understand something, all right, Tom started, talking faster than they could think. I like the president. I wouldn't work for him if I didn't like the president, you know, but he's, he can't go on like this. He's, Helen blinked, reading closer. Melanoma? Terminal melanoma. He's hardly in the White House anymore. Half the time he's hooked up to some machine of Walter Reed. Everyone thinks something's up. We can't, we can't be a strong nation without a dying leader, and the president's dying? He's probably already dead. I know you can dig up something more concrete if you just, you know, wanted, someone's gotta know. Helen, uh, nodded. Tucking the folder under her arm with a grim look on her face, she opened the door again, slipping back out of the concrete. Maze. You won't use my name, right? Tom called out almost in, after in the top. I don't want them knowing me. Of course, no names. But that is unfortunate. Chip looks like a weirdy fellow, but he is well, who he is. Um, so I guess that's the end of Philip Hart, which sucks because I kind of like seeing what he can do. But, oh, science expenditure. My bad. We're just spending billions more dollars. That's okay. So we're going to end the episode here. In the next episode, we'll explore all of Chip Hart and just kind of see what, what's going to happen with him. So if you enjoyed the video... Leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. Let me know what your thoughts are on Phil Apart, and I'll see you tomorrow in what probably will be the last episode of this campaign. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.